Today I'm going to talk a little bit about progress monitoring. Really, just a refresher for you in the NAP system. So a lot of it's going to be reviewed for what you've already seen, what you know, and I'll get to talk a little bit about uh, maybe some future things, things that are coming. One of the things that, uh, as we start talking about progress monitoring, it's really difficult to talk about progress monitoring without talking about goals first. That's one of the things that uh, when we're asked to monitor, or when we go in with and help the DOE monitor uh, school districts, one of the first things we look at when we look at IEPs is first of all continuity. Is when you look at present levels, you look at goals and services, all those things make sense together. When you see progress monitoring, it's connected throughout this, the uh, process. If you've been to some of the goal trainings I've done in the past, or you can see there's some resources on our website around this as well, but it's a circular process. As you go to progress monitoring, it leads in into present levels and goals and so forth. So it's really a never ending cycle. So I always ask folks to, when you start thinking about how you're gonna progress monitor, monitor a student, you really need to start at present levels. because That's your starting point for the whole thing. And when we get to review IEPs, I'm sure you guys have experienced this with IEPs coming to you. Uh, if present levels are poorly written, if there's no data there, the rest of the IEP is gonna fall apart as well. You know, I've seen a couple of situations where even the goals are well written, but then you look back to present levels and there's nothing there to support it. So that's one of the things we look for when we're, when we're reviewing IEPs is that there are there is data to support things. It's relevant, it's clear, and, and important for that student. So you know, we'll go so far as to say that's the gateway for the rest of the IEP. If present levels of data is not there, then there's not much else to do. And when we get into the process, you know, the goals here. We, you know, we want to make sure that we're answering to the needs of the student. So it's writing the goal, we establish what the need, needs are for that student, and the goal is measurable, and, and, and we can progress monitor it reliably. And when we're thinking about when you write your goal, this is advice I give every teacher I, I, I can as far as writing goals, is uh, make sure you have progress monitoring in mind as you do it. So you're thinking about how am I going to collect this data. If it's happening in the classroom, you do have to be careful. You know, I've seen lots of goals written around in all situations and all times and locations. There's no possible way you can be with a student at all times, all situations. So how are you gonna collect that information? So you have to put a practical spin on these things also. One of the things that I try to instill in teachers when I get, get a chance is you, you wanna write goals about things you can see, you can do, the student, you can observe the student doing, there's data to support what's going on. So just keep those, I'm sure you guys are already have those kind of things in mind, but. That's key as you start looking at uh, progress monitoring in the future. Make sure those things you can do. I've seen lots of goals, uh, especially behavior, <laughs> written around the student will behave appropriately, which is kind of a vague term in the first place, but at all locations and all times during the school day. Unless you have someone walking behind that student all the way during the school day, you're not gonna know for sure. So, and I know in, in your situations, you're gonna have a lot of things you want to start doing with you when you're not around. So how are you going to monitor those kind of things? And that, those, those are some big questions, and you're going to need your gen ed teachers or your, other, your specialized partner teachers to help you along that route as well. So just keeping those kind of things in mind. Uh, so the, uh, so that, those are some, just some overviews of the, what goals and where we can go with this. Um, this is your, your favorite IEP system, that could be the only one probably, so it's gotta be your favorite, right? Uh, so this is, uh, we have our progress monitoring wizard we can go to and, and monitor some things. Uh, I'm gonna go into the IEP system first and just walk through, usually we have a lot of questions around the four categories available when you write, write a new goal. So we'll spend a little time talking about those things. If you have questions or have concerns, don't act no. Uh, Ask now's a chance to ask those things. We'll get into those pieces and let you talk through some of those options. Um, so I'm going to go into a student here and just start from the beginning. Hey, <laughs> yeah, don't look at that. <laughs> if yours looks like that, you might be a little nervous. <laughs> I only work on one of those students at a time. I know, that's awesome. I lost my wireless connection. Mm -hmm. So, pause. Mm -hmm. Nice mm -hmm. thing about web based. So, let me talk a little bit about while that's going. It's, it's not happening. 
<laughs> Once again, let me talk about those four different pieces. You know, um, just as a show of hands of my curiosity, because I went to a district the other day, and about 85% of the goals were descriptive documentation, maybe maybe higher percentage than that. How many of you use rely on that mostly? No? I do more now because of some of the changes in mm -hmm. how the goals have been set up. Okay. How about single point? Single point. Okay, that's good. How about the rubrics? Single rubric? That's good. And collection of indicators? Oh, all right. You got some on the cutting edge of our brave people, our souls out there, I suppose. Uh, the thing to remember as you're looking at those four pieces is, that first of all, it really comes down to your comfort level and what your favorite method is around which one, because you're going to find that you may have the same or similar goal coming in from someone else and they've chosen a different progress monitoring method than you. There's, not, there's no right or wrong. I know there's some guidance about which one's better than the others and you might have your favorite, but one of the activities I do often in the progress monitoring uh, training or workshops is given a goal, let's try to fit it in all four of these categories and it can be done pretty easily. So it's, it gets to be a, it gets to be how you think about things. So, um, so there's really no best way to do it. They all meet the basic criteria of goals in, in, in the, for, from Article 7, so they can be used at any time, and any combination of those four can be used. So if you have a goal, an IP that uses just single point, that's fine, but if they've been mixed with all four, that's no problem either. So just keep that in mind as you look at it. Now the four categories that we have is, a, I don't like kind of sad face behind me, makes me nervous. Um, <laughs> The four categories that we have are descriptive documentation, and you guys are, are well acquainted with that one, I'm sure. It's the probably the easiest to set up as far as there's no parameters for the goal. You have to set the timeline for when the goal is going to be in effect. The way that it is monitored is by a, there we go, is by, excuse me, your text entries. So when you do progress monitoring, it just asks for your text, your observations, there we go. <laughs> What's that? To see how happy you are when it works. Oh, it's a little bit <laughs> difficult when we start doing uh, presentations on an electronic IP when the what internet doesn't work. Uh, yeah. Well, the first I got to tell you a story. The first time I ever did the training, um, the I think the day of my first training was the first day that PCG was delivering the final product to us. So. I got there not sure if it was going to work, and pretty sure it wasn't. So it was, <laughs> it was one of those things where I was doing the building the airplane while I was flying it. Uh, not recommended by any means, but it really makes you learn. You learn how to, how to think on your feet a little bit, and that happens. A little tap dance and a few things like that. Uh, this is this is the goal page because you've probably I'm sure you've seen this umpteen thousand times by now. Uh, no big changes on this particular page. Um, let me go into the goals themselves so you can start seeing some of the uh, information changes as we look at it. The, uh, one of the things that I talk about a lot of times, and this is, you know, as you write your annual goal, the, uh, it is important to think about what, how we're going to progress monitor, how we're going to get this data, how can I do this? Because you guys, every single one of you have a significant caseload full of students. How do you spend time, you know, how do you spend time serving them and the minimum collecting this data? How, what's the easiest way to do that? I can't, I can't give you, I wish I could give you an easy answer for that, but as I tell everyone when we do goals training, when you set up the, these parameters, remember you guys are the only ones who know your caseload, your time frame, and what you do every day. So keep that in mind as you set these things up. You know, I've seen plenty of times where people over, uh, over commit to these kind of things where they're gonna, hey, I'm gonna progress monitor everybody every two weeks this year, it's gonna be great. What happens when you don't, when you can't? So you have to keep those things in mind. You always wanna keep as much, you know, when we talk about collecting data, you always wanna have enough to help you make decisions so you know what's going on. I know most of you, if not all of you, are taking daily data on your students and that's, that's really what this is about, not that you have to put daily data in here. But I do ask, you know, as you're starting to record data for your student, you know, some, some districts will do an average, so over a month or over two weeks or whatever it happens to be, 
the average in all those data points for that one point to put in for the month or the nine weeks or what have you. You don't necessarily have to average things. If you just pick a point in time, that's really all progress monitoring is. So you don't have to do any extra math. Uh, you can just pick a day every fifth, the 15th of every month. What data do I have on that day? And that's what I'm going to put in. So it doesn't have to be anything beyond. You don't have to do any extra math if you don't want to, as long as you're showing clear progress over time. So as we look at this thing, one of the things that, you know, the method instrument for monitoring progress, again, speaks right to progress monitoring. What device, what tool, what observation, what technique am I going to use that's going to give me the data point I want to, want to track for this student. So maybe a, a test that's already been done, something you already do every day, uh, but be clear on what that is. So, so whoever picks up the IEP next knows what's going on. That's really the bottom line on, on most of these things. So our four different options for progress monitoring, and descriptive, single point, single rubric, and collection indicators are there. Um, I don't spend a whole lot of time talking about standards when I do goal, goals or even progress monitoring, because my, at least my, my belief is that a goal is not made or, made or broken based on what standard you pick. Uh, if you pick the wrong standard, is that, what effect does that have? Uh, the important thing is the goal is well written, and you can progress one of those things. Now, other people may have different opinions on that, obviously, but uh, and especially difficult in some of your situations where there's not going to be goals, it's, it's gonna, not going to be specific standards that address those things. So you have to pick some broad standard that everything fits under. Now, one of the things that's coming up and is supposed to be in place by the end of this month are the, well, it's not common core, it's core content connectors. Change the word, it's still CCCs, but they're the the breakdowns of the, of the uh, college and career ready standards. So you'll see some things that are more specific. It's more designed for spe with special education in mind, I think. They were a bear to put in the system, so they're, but they are coming. So those things are coming, I think, in the next month. And you should look forward. I don't know if you guys know the name, uh, Amy Howie with Project Success. Uh, she's done a lot of work with the uh, alternate assessment, NICSIC assessments and things like that. I'm going to be working with, do a little interview with her and have her explain the new, the, those, those connectors and it'll be coming out later this month, I believe, also. So we'll have some more information. If you're interested in that, if that's a population of students you deal with, you can find more about that then. So the descriptive we spoke about, again, the only drawback with the descriptive is that it doesn't produce a graph like the other three options do. Um, which may or may not be a deciding factor for you. I do give you this advice when you're doing it, that, that, that you still should be putting data in that documentation so that if you wanted to graph it, you could, if that makes sense. So there's data in there that you can rely on and, and, and the parents can check into. Uh, single point, obviously if there's a number coming back from your observations, single point's a good, prop, good option for you to use. It's very simple to progress model. You put in the number, it plots it on a graph for you. Pretty easy to read, pretty easy to share. Uh, single rubric, everyone starts kind of grinding their teeth sometimes when they start talking about rubrics. Uh, and so actually a good number of you are using this, so you, you probably start to develop some rubrics you can share. Remember, and I'll show you again in here, there is a rubric bank. Have anybody used a rubric bank in the system yet? It's, it's not as user-friendly as I'd like it to be but it does allow you to store and reuse rubrics, so it at least gives you that benefit. And you can also steal other people's rubrics using it, so, yes? If you have time, will you show us that again? That's where the fees come in, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> After the camera's off, we'll see what, <laughs> what we'll bid for that one. Um, yeah, I can show you what that looks like a little bit. Uh, it's, you know, we have a walkthrough of Indiana IEP on our site, and it does walk through that piece, too. It's, that might not be your cup of tea, but I'll try to show it to you. Okay. Uh, the collection of indicators also uses rubrics to help uh, to help document progress for the student. I have been talking with floating this idea with our with our development team and stakeholders. Uh, collection of indicators right now relies on rubrics, and so basically it's a repetition of the single rubric concept. I've also been talking about doing that the same thing with single point, so it'll be a repetition of single the single point concept. So for each each objective, you'd be able to set up a single point routine for that. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, but I think a lot of people do that, want to do that anyway. I see a lot of rubrics numbers slapped in there anyhow, so that might be a good way to track things. It used to be under single point, you couldn't have multiple 
questions that you're monitoring in it, like for us, that's mm -hmm. really helpful to like get the original students and if it's not for me, you can have them separated right. and I know that went away and now it's only one. Is there any consideration to breaking that back out? Well, that's kind of where I was getting, getting to a change in the option for collection of indicators. The, the issue comes with the, the uh, reporting and data collection really wasn't set up to collect the information that people were putting in. And to be honest with you, this is a, a discussion and debate we have with PCG and the Department of Education from the get-go. Uh, our vision was to lock down single point, single rubric, so with no objectives from the get from the beginning. But for whatever reason, that was delayed for until recently. So, so um, I don't think they understood how many people were using it the way it was was allowed at the time. So that's that's one of the drawbacks. But. Um, and it kind of leaves us in a, in a, in a kind of awkward place too, is there's not, if you have to write objectives for your students, you only have two options to do that now, with the, with the descriptive and the collection being your two choices there. So that's, uh, we do realize that, and I'm tr we'll try to get back to where we can do this and some, make it a little easier. I know a collection, a lot of people avoid the collection of indicators because it has rubrics built in, they don't like to use rubrics. Whatever reason. I don't want to sit and write all of the about because it's already in my goal. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? So why would you write it again? Yeah, it's um well. <laughs> right. yeah. and a lot of the data that we collect, the single point works really well for mm -hmm. it, but if we have a student who's working on eight or ten different sounds, mm -hmm. nobody wants to see eight or ten right. goals well, in all our simulation goals. Right. Um, you know, the teachers don't like it. I think it's confusing for the parents. Again, I think, they, they have to print well, a 20-page IDP in that way. I realize I'm in a room full of SLP, so I'm probably going to get beat down when I say this. So <laughs> I'll try and see what happens. One of the things that may help with some of those things, and some folks like when I talk about this, some folks don't, um, is look about look at the outcomes. For your, you know, you may be working on several sounds, maybe working on several different pieces, but what are you really looking to change for the student? What's when, that, when I'm in the classroom? What difference does that make for that individual? Is we're looking at clear speech and, and maybe, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm just, that's the thing, you know, when I talk with, um, I guess I'll put it on someone else's shoulders. So the first first time I started talking about this with a group of occupational therapists, and a lot of their goals were around very specific things and different movements they're trying to, different fine motor skills they're working on with the student. And you can write down 30 different things you're working on, but really what's the big picture? What's the outcome you're trying to get for this student in that classroom? What's going to be the difference when they can do all these things? And that's really what I try to get people to think think about anyway. So that, that's not, I'm not saying you need to wholesale change anything, but at least give that some thought as, you know, what's, what's when I get all this work done, what's going to be different for the student in the classroom? I think sometimes though, when we're thinking about the whole overall goal, if you write it with the end in mind and you set it up that way then it's not going to show that you're making progress along the levels you know, well and that's that's really the way that this thing, the, the collection of indicators is really designed so we can set here's what here's the end in mind we're trying to get to we want the students to be able to do this observable skill mm -hmm. and improve in this this observable area or we're going to have some evidence up and our objectives can then be here are all the things we're going to do and that, that's really the way that that's designed to work. So the first thing to consider is that goal statement is measurable. So here's something that's going to change. Right now, here's what the student can do. In a year, here's what we expect them to be able to do differently or in an improved manner, however it's going to be worded. And the objectives in, here's all the little steps we're going to take along the way. So that's where you're going to talk about the individual things you're going to do. And it's, it, that's specialized for that student. Does that make sense? Because I get that it, it it can feel redundant if, if you're if you're writing goals a different way. I get that if you put everything in the annual goal statement, you feel like you're repeating it in the in the objectives. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the big picture, what's the big change that we're expecting from the student in a year? Uh -huh. Are you going to talk about the maybe jumping ahead, but in collective indicators, saying do the individual objectives go together like average or like a formula for that the overall? Year. Yes. Okay. So, I can, can talk about the math if you want. But don't they separate them out when they send progress home? 
they have the one big right. thing on the goal, and then they have each the objective has its own progress. Right. So I always tell my parents, look at the, the mm -hmm. work Yeah, I always what I tell folks to think about, and this might be a good analogy for parents mm -hmm. as well. This is like a report. The overall is like your report card, your overall grade, your sixty, your seventy, your eighty. And when you look below that, that's like looking at the at your yeah at your grade book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is what's going on that's affecting that overall outcome. So that that might help that discussion a little bit. Uh, it might not. If grades are confusing in the first place a lot of times, but um, but that can help some. It gives you just a big picture of what's happening. So um, let's take a look and are we okay? <laughs> It's all right. I just have one question. When you add objectives, mm -hmm. if we write those objectives, then do they automatically go into each of those spots where we would put a rubric? For the collection of indicators? Yeah. You know what? We've had a lot of questions about collection of indicators. Why don't we start with that especially one? Use, <laughs> and, uh, especially <laughs> teachers use that a lot, but yeah. we haven't done, or okay. I haven't done. So I well, let me uh, start there. All right. So the first thing with the collection of indicators is we want, this is, you want to add objectives or benchmarks first for this one. So I'm just going to put in two or three dummy ones here and uh, we'll see what we get. I'm real happy right now. I'll be real. Real creative. So, the, so there's some objectives in place when we done it there, but that's life, I guess. So, so reflection indicators, it's important you put your objectives in first. Because when we get into edit the progress monitoring, that's where we're going to set up our rubrics that, that we're going to use. And I'm also going to take a little time here to show you the rubric bank. So, uh, see how that goes. So, let's go edit progress monitoring. Okay. <laughs> okay, first things first, when we get in here, one of the stubble changes to the system now, if you're revising IEPs or you're at an annual and you update the date, you can apply those dates immediately. So you don't have to do any one by one to do that. You guys are probably are aware of that, but I'd like to say, hey, we did a good thing there. <laughs> the, uh, this is a little bit different than the other three options, and this piece at the top is talking about the overall. So your big annual goal that you've written, what's your initial percentage, what do you know about it right now, what's your target percentage, where would you like to get? So if they're at 50% completion of the task now, where would you like them to get by the end of this IEP year? Okay. Initial and target dates, when you can apply those and fill in. Frequency is something that everyone hates to talk about, but I'm going to anyway, is, you know, you want to put record enough information here to give you what you need. So you guys are already doing daily pro progress report for your students. I don't, I, don't expect, I don't think anybody expects you to repeat that here. But, you know, think about how much, it, a lot of times what, what I see on progress reports for, for parents is one data point per nine weeks, which is the minimum, that's the minimum for reporting. So. That, that, you know, if I just have one nine weeks report, that doesn't really tell me a whole lot of information. It just gives me a snapshot. Here's what they can do right now. So you guys can decide for yourselves how many, if you'd like to do more than that or whatnot. But I think the more you can put in here, the more, in, the more powerful those graphs are going to be for parents to see. I think that, that, and it's going to be more evident of all the work that you guys are doing as well. So that's, that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> uh, the, and by the way, there's no law around how much, how often we have to record data. There's nothing in the rule about that at all. It has to do, it has to do with reporting. It's assumed that we collect progress monitoring data repeatedly. It doesn't ever say how often or how much and those kind of things. Uh, the only guidance that's out there right now is from the National Center for Response Intervention. It used to be a National Center for Progress Monitoring. Uh, is, is that we should shoot for doing it monthly or so having, having one data point per month. So that's guidance. It's not law. It's not rule. It's just the important thing on those. <laughs> there's a whistle in the background. But, uh, the important thing is that you collect and you collect in the data you need, need. And you guys are already doing that. I just want to make sure that you're representing that and you're so you're getting credit for the work you're doing. I, think I try to tell teachers that all the time because you 
everybody collects data all the time, whether it's formally or informally. And, and to get credit for it, you've got to put it down somewhere. And so parents can see it. Now, you may be supplying parents with all those reports already, uh, which is fine. Uh, probably a really good thing but just think about how you're going to do this the other thing i always mention here this is this can be scary when you get a move in and someone says you're going to collect data every day so this is one of the things that when you have a move in a conference or even you accept one from one of your peers and you maybe someone's playing a little joke on you see if they catch this in the iep we're going to have them do two assessments a day see how that floats you know i've seen people accidentally do that where they wanted to put in two 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 assessments per quarter and they chose day instead and they've got to change it and then they get freaked out because oh my gosh uh, because that is an issue if, if you come to one of those fun things like due process and you don't have the data points that it says you're supposed to have then you you're lost you know uh, so i wonder if i mentioned due process the root kind of gets quiet so. <laughs> now the thing you can do with this this again we're looking at a collection of indicators when you add an assessment, there's a little add assessment button here. It adds this little piece right here. So progress monitor, you can name this whatever you want it to be, if it's specific speech sound or what have you, and then the assessment you're going to use. This is where your rubric can go in place. Now, I don't say a lot of nevers, but one thing I will say is never uses apply defaults. Because if you click on it, it's, there's, not, there's nothing measurable about those. They're just guidelines for those things. Now, I'd like to you're going to see that button go away, I think, when we finally convince people to do that. But um, it's easy to push that one button and be done, but it doesn't really tell you anything if you really look at those um, things. Now, nobody stared at me real hard, so hopefully you guys are all putting your own rubrics in there. It's not something you have to go, oh my gosh, revise all my life to, to change that now, but when you get the opportunity, Put in a little more information for those things because it's i'll put the hit apply default so we can see what that what i mean by all these the this is the default rubric and this is this is like when i started in the special ed classroom we did this by quarter one two three four no progress some progress great progress goal complete and that's kind of what that is it's it doesn't tell you much but it does technically qualify as progress monitoring so just be careful with how you use those defaults. So let me go through just a general, I don't want to confuse things, so let me just go through a general explanation of this and then I'll come back to the rubric bank so you can see how that works. A couple things with rubrics, you don't have to fill in all the blanks. So when you're looking at this, you have, you have to fill in at least three things. So you don't have to fill in all seven. You can start with, you can start with just three if that's where you're comfortable. So what I often advise is you put in the present level and introduced and demonstrated to be where you're shooting for that you predicted like so basically a restatement of your goal or your objective and then developing somewhere in between and if, the, if you just have those three things then you've got a rubric you can use okay and if you want to fill in more detail you can then show the steps now the thing i really like about the rubrics and i think the reason a lot of people start using them as they get more experience in the system is it's, it does a nice job and allows you to show very small steps in progress. So that if a student has a difficult time in a specific area, you can determine what steps you're going to administer, you're going to look at here. So if it's just a just a few things, a few more times they can use a certain phrase or or, or, word, or letter combination, then that's what we can monitor. We don't have to wait for you know from introduce being to here's where they, they they can't do this skill at all to demonstrate now they're an expert in there that's really not going to happen in a year and i've seen goals written similarly where the same goal stays in place for years on end because the student's never going to reach that so you can manipulate things so you can show progress i always use the example of a couple of schools i work with that had some alternate alternate schools alternative school settings where they had to report out every month so progress is typically not shown in a month unless you look at very small in increments so that's what they did at the rubrics is set up very small steps that they could monitor and then they could show some growth that way uh, so i always try to share that as we're looking looking forward so that's the rubric there and uh as we scroll across the page nothing new here i don't think with initial and target value here's where collection of indicators is kind of neat and at least okay that's my opinion but i'll go ahead and i'll stick by it uh, these are the three objectives that i've set and some of you have used this and know this well. 
But when I check off these, uh, I can make one. I can put in one rubric and assign it to all three of these if I want to. So if you have one rubric, you can use for all those. If maybe you have several different letter sounds that you're going to monitor, you might have the same rubric you use for all four or five. Or you might have a different rubric. You can do that too. So if, I, if this rubric is going to apply to all three, I just check off all three, save and continue, and I'm done with this. So you don't have to use one rubric. Ah, oh. I can leave now. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, you still get three different graphs. Yes. Oh. Yeah. I think so. I think I can stop. That's pretty good. Every once in a while, I hit one of those moments.